Hello everybody and welcome to Amigo Museum Special. This is a revisiting of a classic, well, semi-classic, Remigo line. It's one of my favorites and with me is President of Biff Bang Pow, Jason Lenzi, to talk a little bit about the Doctor Who line that they produced. Welcome, Jason. Hello, Brian. Uh, Hello, Brian. I believe we've met. Um, we, we have met. I've heard about you. Now, this is without hyperbole my favorite Remigo line that ever came out because it was such wish fulfillment and I know you're a humongous uh, Doctor Who fan as well obviously we've, we've, we've spent a hundred thousand hours talking about it but this was your dream line was it not? Well it was it's funny um, when I started this thing how I sort of had a short list of stuff I wanted to go after um, Doctor Who was never on the list because this goes you know this goes back a ways, and by the time, you know, we really started to get the company kicked off, uh, you know, pro um, uh, Product Enterprise was doing stuff for Doctor Who, and, and I just didn't think in terms of anything beyond Ultra Cult that we'd be able to, you know, to get anything. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't at the forefront, but there was always in the, in the back of my, my mind, I always thought, if I could, this is what I would like to do, because the sort of the impetus for it was, you know, that you and I have so many parallel stories about how we, we saw this show, you saw it earlier than me, or how we got our information. And there's a famous issue of um, the Doctor Who magazine that was sort of a merchandise issue, as close as we ever got to a guide back in those days. And one of the entries was for the Dennis Fisher line. And oh, that's yeah. how, you know, at 11 or 12, I even knew that that anything had ever existed. You know, I wanted I wanted action figures when I was a kid. So I didn't know these even existed. So that one page pre-internet was what I would sort of study and just lust after those those things. Um, so when when we sort of got things rolling, and it was right around the time that, that we were really entertaining the eight inch figure thing, like that was starting yeah, to Yeah, you, you of, were working with, um, with MC Toys. Were you just licensing the body? Is that what happened? I think so. Yeah, that's what we so we would go after the licenses, and we had to get very specific on it. And we had done at that point, I think we had done Venture Brothers, maybe, and one or two others. Because I remember on a trip to London, um, meeting with the BBC, because at that point they had they had you know every category taken care of, and these conversations were happening with the 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 agent, the BBC agent in the states, and. I finally said, "Well, look, I'm going to be in London. If there's a way I can go and, and plead our case to the, to the licensors when I get there, then I, you know, I'd, I'd love to do that." So I brought along, I think, a Venture Brothers and something else. I think if this is if this is coming back to me, the problem they had was, "Well, we've got so much merchandise out there. What are you going to do? Action figures are taken care of. Twelve-inch figures are taken care of." And so I thought, "Well, eight-inch figures, because." Not only would that have most likely been the style I would have gotten as a kid had it been an American show, um, there was a line made in 76 uh, by Dennis Fisher, but they were 10-inch figures. So technically, it never got the Migo treatment. It never, was, it, never, it never really got the... I mean, no Dennis Fisher's like a, an offshoot of Migo or part of Migo, whatever. But it never had a line that fit in with the rest of the 8-inch figures and that was when i thought oh okay that's a way to go we can we can kill it you know a couple of birds with, with one stone you know and and i would and the and the idea would be for me selfishly um if this is all we could do if this was the cat and then we opened up other categories as well as it went on but for yeah. the figures i wanted to immediately replicate the dennis fisher line in eight inch form because it's the era that I love the most. It's the, the you know, the, the Tom Baker, the look of Tom Baker, everything. And that was, that was where it sort of came from. That was the idea. Yeah, and you guys really nailed it with that era of Tom Baker. Like, your opening figures were uh, the Master, but it was, of course, the Deadly Assassin Master. Uh, the Sontaran from the Sontaran Experiment, which I think is the third episode in Baker's season. Um, story, yeah. Yeah, T Tom Baker himself, and then um, I'm struggling at this moment to think of the fourth figure that's just around. Well, it was, uh, the first thing was we were going to do a Sarah Jane. We wanted that's to do right. 
we wanted to do the doctor. And I kept using as the image of the doctor, I kept telling everyone, Sculptor, you know, BBC, everybody on the team, this is, this is what I'm thinking of. And it's that, that opening image from the beginning of the show. The yeah. And that was, a, that was one of the very first Doctor Who collectibles I ever got was, was a color button or badge, as they would say in the UK, and the TARDIS pin with Baker in the doorway. Mm. I think, ironically, both use the same image of Baker on that, that button, and cause it's the, his body is painted in the doorway of that pin, but the face is a, is a photograph. Whereas yeah, I remember that. Later, when they did Davison, it was just a, a photograph. But that was the look, that, 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 that shot of Tom Baker at the beginning of Pyramids of Mars, where he looks up at the camera, or toward the camera, and he's wearing that fedora, and he's giving the speech about... Uh, walking you know, walking eternity, in eternity, yeah. That to me is the that to me is the image of Tom Baker before he went, you know, all goggle eyed and you know completely loony toward toward his, the, the, his later years. So I wanted that Tom Baker. I wanted Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane was going to the outfit that I had picked out was the um, Revenge of the Cybermen outfit. So the military, the camo pants, yeah, and the, our trousers, military sweater, you know, the green sweater and everything, because it was a cool it was a cool look for her. Um, at the time, um, the word we finally got, first there was confusion with the licensing department, as people warned me about with the BBC. Mm-hmm. But then we got word from um, from the BBC that that uh, Elizabeth Clayton did not want to, was not approving anything at the time. And it might have been around the time that she was ill. Actually, I think, I think I recall a conversation with you. Where yeah, she passed away not long after you told me she refused to do any uh, merchandise. I think I think what it was is I think they were I think she was she was ill at the time because I think she'd gone through her treatments and then she did that last season of Sarah Jane afterwards. But I think at the time, the last thing they were going to do was bother the family with any kind of likeness things or you know setting something through to get um, get approved. So of course we didn't know that, but so I thought, okay, well let's do Leela because then we end up replicating the Dennis Fisher line. So we did the TARDIS, we did Tom Baker, we did Leela, we did a Cyberman, but he was a Cyber Leader. Yeah. Uh, we made a canine. Um, we eventually made a Dalek in the next wave. So the only thing I think we were missing was the the giant robot. That's and right, Leela, and, so. and 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 this is not known to people. But you guys were planning to reproduce the Denny Fisher boxes for San Diego Comic Con. Yeah. Uh, because I actually scanned the boxes for you guys. You guys were going to do smaller versions of the Denny Fisher boxes. And I'm so we sorry gonna... that didn't happen. And we were going to do a paint scheme for the Dalek. If the Dalek made it out in time, we were going to do a paint scheme uh, as same as the as the colors on the on the, the Dennis Fisher Dalek. Um, so that was the that was the idea, and it was it was and they took it took some convincing. And when I made that trip, and I sat with them and explained what we were trying to do, you know, I I had to sort of give the history as well, which is you know you do that a lot when you're you know this isn't me talking out of school or saying anything negative, but but, but a lot of times when you're dealing with a a studio or a network and a license. You're you're talking to somebody who understands the ins and outs of the process, but doesn't necessarily know the property. And it's very easy to you know quiz them or or trip them up by saying something they don't make that reference or whatever. Um, but you, yeah, it's, their, it's their job. They're not passionate fans. Yeah, and you have so you kind of have to think to yourself what are, what are the headaches going to be with this, and how can I avoid them or how can I you know, get get there ahead of them and say, well, this is what we really want to do, and if we could, we'd do this. And and the stuff was very successful. You know, it was it really did it really did well. The process was a little sticky. Um, I remember getting to Comic Con that year and calling you from the road, I think, and saying, you're not going to believe this. And we had shipped the very first sets were 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 down there. They were already down there at the Entertainment Earth booth. And somehow we got word that, you know, you got to wait. There's something that needs to be approved still. I think we were all good to go. But the, but again, the the red tape, you know, the process of, well, well, we still need to sign off on this bit. And it's like, look, it'll be fine. Let's just put them out. 
you know, and the more I did this, the more I sort of heard from other companies or, or witnessed things from other companies where they didn't wait and they would just put it out and better to ask forgiveness than permission sort of thing. But we yeah. were very paranoid about such things and so we always waited. And so we had signage out front of the booth and we had the stuff down there and we weren't allowed to sell it to the, uh, to the, to the, the concert goers, to the convention goers. And uh, and that was that that hurt. That really hurt because we made something we thought was really cool and uh, didn't get to get it out there. That that particular Comic Con. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, but you guys did uh, end up expanding the line into wonderful ways during your time. Like uh, you did that incredible TARDIS playset that really harkens back to the Mego vinyl play sets you know like it's not the denny fisher tardis there's no gizmo in it but it came with a beautiful replication of the tardis console with sound effects and K9. like That's that right. was, a, it was a huge accomplishment and you yeah. you started yeah. to get out of the baker era and into the modern area unfortunately your wings got clipped but you did manage to produce that wonderful uh Two pack of the first and current Doctor for the 50th anniversary with the Matt Smith and William Hartnell. Were you guys going to plan to do all the Doctors? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we yeah. had. We it was going to be. Um, uh, Pertwee was next, um, and oh, then that kills me. We were going to do Amy Pond, and we had a Rory uh, lined up, and new modern Daleks, the brightly colored Daleks, which didn't didn't go over really well on the show, but I. I thought it would be a kind of nice contrast with the with the Dalek that we had. The Dalek we we did do, which is truly oh, it's in my gorgeous. top five. It's yeah. truly my top my top five uh, of any of the items that Biff Bang Pow ever made. It's in my top five because I just I, I I love it so much. If I had if I had that when I was eleven or twelve, you know, I would never have left the house. But um, uh, it, that took a lot. <laughs> to get it right and to get it all signed off on and we just squeaked that out so we had the Matt Smith and the William Hartnell uh, two pack we had them individually carded we were going to do a Weeping Angel 8 inch as well um, and I think and then we were going to do Lee Sin Chang yes and um, um, you know so I, I sort of being the, the, of, of the team the one that knew this show and knew the era that I wanted to sort of play in um, and by the way a quick little fun thing about the Centauran was um, yeah, again, selfishly, a lot of this was what did I experience? We did Sutech as well. Uh, yeah, well, that, the, in, I, I've always liked to think you did Sutech for me. Well, I did it for you, yes, yeah. yes, first and foremost. And then it was, this, well, this was the show that I loved so much, the, the mummies and Sutech and, you know, that, that era that you and I love with the, the gothic, you know, Philip Hinchcliffe kind of kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you start making a list of like, oh, we could do, you know, oh, we did a, we did a scare off of Jaggeroth as well. We did a scare off in the suit with the, That's right. I thought, the... Cool. so part of it was like thinking in terms of, um, you know, character stuff, but also, okay, wait a second, we got these bodies. Now, what's the, what's a fun thing, you know, you go, oh, an Auton would be fun to make or, or, you know, uh, the scare off would be good or the Centauran was a double, uh, a double whammy for me because. Um, you know, all the stuff that we've ever read, it says that the mask in the Centauran experiment is the same, they use the same mold from the Time Warrior, but they made it slightly different or something. And I don't see a resemblance in the two at all, because to me, the Centauran experiment, that's what I think of when I think of a Centauran. And that mm -hmm. reminds me of the pull-out poster from Famous Monsters. He's featured on oh, that yeah. poster. And I used to study that that photograph. Like, what is this thing? It's so it's so weird looking. But it's also the only story that a Centauran has five fingers in. Every That's right. Other one, so you really you know, lucked out there. You didn't have to do hand molds. Exactly. And and that was a big part of it too. Was like, is this stuff going to work? There's so much stuff out there right now. If it does work, you know, uh, great. But we need to we need to be careful in how many accessories and you know how how you know how much we can use the same body and you know stuff like that so we we um you know we picked we had to pick and choose how we were we were doing stuff and i think leela there was there was a brief conversation about rooted hair or just molded and i said 
the axe of molded, you know, it should, it should be molded here, which it was. Um, we did Rooted for Battlestar Galactica, which are fun. I mean, she's fun, Athena, but um, I prefer uh, just molded hair is fine with me. I know that's not a very Mego thing to say, but... Well, it, it goes it goes in and out. There, there's times where I, I think with Leela it worked. Generally, I like the rooted hair myself, but with Leela, you you guys nailed a nice Louise Jameson, and because she kind of had, um, what I guess you'd call like mussy hair on the show, rooted wouldn't yeah. have kind of worked as well as sculpting it for that occasion, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I think you're you're probably right. Yeah. So we, we, you know, and then I signed off on all the stuff and I thought it was ready to go and it looked how I thought it should look. And then we would send it to the BBC. Mm-hmm. And once getting, a, getting an email, come back, and it was, was it Leela or Sarah, Sarah Jane? We did a whole, you know, a whole it was layout. Leela. How she was going to look and everything and, and, you know, images and drawings and from the sides and the front, this is the outfit. And we got a message back saying, this is not even a Doctor Who character. Please, <laughs> please go back to the drawing board and resubmit. And it was like, and, and you gave the the loudest actually ever. Yeah, yeah, from across the across the pond. I was like, um, <laughs> so there was there was some of that, and there was some you know up to the deadline sort of signing off on stuff. And then what also happened um, is that we had someone we had someone that was handling stuff for us right up to the license. I, I'm, this is coming back to me now. I'm not going to, I don't remember names, but I wouldn't mention them anyway. But this guy was, I mean, we instantly hit it off. So he's in New York and I'm in LA and we're making all these phone calls. And this guy was like, he couldn't believe that I grew up in the Twin Cities. Like he, I, I knew everything from his childhood, all the stuff he watched and all the shows and, and you know, the toys that he had and the Doctor Who era that he knew. And so we instantly spoke the same language. And he brought the license right up to fruition. And I thought, well, here's, this is going to be, this is our man in Havana. This is the guy we're going to be dealing with in New York. And this will be a great conduit between us and, you know, and the, the time difference and everything else. But he, uh, whatever I can say to him, he gets it, he'll relay and we're, we're good. And the next thing I think we got was, I got a, a beautiful poster. Um, whatever that, whatever that, I want to say the first, Smith season, maybe? It's oh, that yeah. poster that had Smith and Amy Pond floating in space in front of the TARDIS. And I got this poster that was signed, it is, I still have it, signed by Smith and uh, Amy Pond, um, whose name uh, I can't say. I got up with her right a little bit after that, so I forgot her name. I feel kind of bad, but apparently she's gone on to do other stuff. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Stephen Moffat, they all signed the poster, and I'm like, well, this is it. We, this is, we're good. The machine starts starts moving and we're, we're good to go and then about two months after we signed the deal uh, he left to move back to London and he, he called me and said I'm so sorry to tell you this but you know but I'm leaving you in good hands you're going to be fine and I just got this this sort of chill down my spine like no oh no don't, do, don't yeah. do this why don't you stay in New York or can't we can't we can't you still be the guy because you can't you can't put a price on having someone you know, in your corner that, that gets this stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, and when you're up against deadlines and, and everything else. Um, and there's a new guy, and again, I'm being very careful here, but I remember a conference call with London as ideas were being thrown out, as the license was expanding. And we were talking about license plate frames and drinkware and things like that. And it, there's this silence on the end of the, the New York end of the phone. And I remember this voice coming and saying, um, can I just, may I just, and yeah, what, what did you want to, and he said, the TARDIS. Now that's, uh, that's, that's rectangle shaped. I mean, right. Uh, I said, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming that these are going to be standard license plate frames, the standard shape, you know, to which I had to stifle my inner voice that wanted to go, no. No, we were going to go triangular for America. Yeah. Just, just do something completely uh, left field. And he was like, yeah, well, maybe we could, maybe there could be something there that could tie it in. And I just thought, this is going to be a bumpy road. If yeah. this is, you know, and and that's kind of what it, 
it sort of became leading up to Comic Con and some other stuff. Where the, you, I never felt like we could bring it to this person and say, "This is where we're at. This is what needs to happen." Um, so that was tricky too, and it just it all starts to add to the time that you've got to do stuff and the the deadlines you're under, you know, and 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 the spirit of it and sort of the enthusiasm for it. You really have to stay enthusiastic all the way with this stuff. Of course, yeah, you've got to keep optimistic, and yeah. Yeah. So, um, a bunch of figures, unfortunately, didn't make the cut because the license ended and was not renewed. Um, of those figures, I know that the prototypes exist, but what is the one that pains you the most that didn't get made? Well, I'd instantly say Sarah Jane Smith. Sarah I mean, Jane, that, yeah. That the... The to me that show, and listen, you know, I started this, you know, this, you know, we're we're on the other side of, you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen years of this idea and, and bringing stuff to market, and then you know, going from Flash Gordon that wasn't even available on DVD in America at the time to you know Marvel and DC and all kinds of you know other other stuff that we did and licenses and stuff. So we, we came a long way. Um, but the idea was to initially was to make stuff that I loved, stuff that I felt was missing, you know. That and and half your brain is like, well, if it's missing, it means somebody wanted to do it and they didn't think it was viable, so don't bother, like Twilight Zone or whatever. But the other part of your brain has to keep saying, no, 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 there's something there. And so for me, when it, when I had these opportunities for certain properties, you know, Doctor Who to me is. You know, I, I hate to qu have to quantify it and, and not say, you know, across the board, I love the show top to bottom. It's, I love it, the concept. It's one of the best concepts in the history of television. But if I really had to do Desert Island, it, it's that Tom Baker era, that, that, that 1978 in America when it was airing in the afternoons, uh, weekday afternoons. And it blew my head off because I didn't know what this thing was that have so many memories. Just like you were talking about, we did the Saturn 3 thing a while back, the episode. We were talking about what this thing means to us, and David was saying how much, how many other memories came back to him watching that movie. Well, to me, that era of Doctor Who is just, I can practically smell what's cooking in the kitchen, you know, when I watch those shows. And, and Sarah Jane and Tom Baker, I mean, I was so sad when she left, when we got that, ep that, that story that she left. Um, and I just think she is the greatest companion in the history of the show. And so I would have loved to have done a set. I actually wanted to do a Harry as well. So you had the three of them from those core stories. Oh, wow. I didn't know well, that. Yeah, it never really, we never really got past, you know, on paper as an idea. So I would say her and uh, the crawl. I love the design of the crawl, the rhinoceros um, uh, uh, dude uh, from yeah. the Android station. Um, yeah, and um, Lee Sin Chang, I think it's a brilliant uh, character as well. So those those kind of bummed me up. That would have been, and I wanted to do some variants on Baker too. I wanted to do some oh, did different you? different outfits. Yeah, yeah, like the the you know I wanted to do Leela. I wanted to do the two of them. You know, City City of Death. That's what we started with Scaroth. And then I wanted to do Baker in that longer coat. and. Well, that was Romana in City of Death, though. Say again? That's Romana in City of Death. What did I say? Who did I say? You said Leela. You wanted Sorry. to do Romana. Romana, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, meant, I meant, I said Leela. I think I was thinking Lala Ward. I said Lila. Right, Lala Leela. <laughs> that's Lala fun to Romana. say. Um, Lala Ward Romana, yeah. And then little sailor outfit or whatever. Not the sailor outfit. She had like the schoolgirl outfit in City of Death. Was yeah, it it's like it's kind of like a little Sailor Moon type outfit. The mm -hmm. um, yeah. the one that always gets me is Mr. Sin, um, which is just such a terrifying character from the show. Um, yeah. It's, its history is related to Flash Gordon. It's played by Deep Roy, who's in both things. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've always been kind of sad that didn't make it to market. As well as your David Tennant. I think your David Tennant was going to be brilliant. Yeah. No, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, we, I wanted, to, oh, we wanted to do so much stuff. We really wanted to just keep going with it. And different TARDISes we could do, like different, you know, shades and different sort of, you know, control consoles because we made it 
very cost uh, effective with the, the the hard cardboard you know paper set. Um, it came with a little key ring too, a little sound effect key ring that yeah, the TARDIS yeah, rather that was happy. brilliant. And then the, the re- it retailed, you know, it was a pretty good retail uh, price on that too, if I recall. Um, so yeah, I wanted to. I'm, I'm really fond of it too. I appreciate you doing this and saying how much you you like it because it, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into that line. For sure, it's it's a fun line, and it, it's um, it's getting cut is one of the, the big regrets for me because I've I like a lot of the new stuff coming out right now. Don't get me wrong; there's some people doing some really fun stuff, but that was my dream line, and I wanted to kind of celebrate it. And I'd love to have you back, and we can talk about some of the other lines that Biff Bang produced in the eight inch format, but. I had to start with this one. As, as always, I always have to start with Doctor Who on these things. Well, and I guess this is as perfect a time as any in case I get hit by a bus tomorrow. But, you know, we... Uh, the BBC... Um, and again, this isn't really... This isn't even talking out of school. But anybody that's dealt with the BBC can tell you they are difficult. They are... There's a lot going on there. They... they you know, the, the guy... Um, product Enterprise folks who are now called... One six or nine six or one seven of nine or whatever they're called. They have a new, new name. I remember hearing stories from them years ago because they had they had the license when the show had not been back on the air yet, and they were trying to finally bring this sonic screwdriver prop to life with you know Baker on the box and the old logo and how they had to fight with them for months about the new logo, the taxi cab. Uh, uh, Eccleston logo and stuff. So I heard, you know, like, careful, he's getting a really... And then suddenly Doctor Who exploded. Like, it came back and it was bigger than ever with tenants. And then it became very much like every T had to be crossed and every I dotted. And they got very sort of hands-on and it, it made things a lot more difficult. But everything we did was successful all the ancillary stuff that we did, the, the toys that we made, we did really well with all the Doctor Who stuff. And then it just just got taken away. The license got taken away from us and a few other companies that were doing great stuff. And suddenly they wanted it all under one umbrella, I think, with um, character options to basically do everything. So we were doing journals and prop replica journals and all kinds of stuff. And... Uh, you know, so that that really hurt because we we really that was a really good time that things were really really cooking. Um, so it was never it was never that the stuff didn't perform or didn't it, it did better than any of them had imagined. I think, and we we opened up categories that they hadn't even thought of. Uh, so it was a good time, um, but um, you know it, it it went away, and you know everything is cyclical. And now I think that. The merchandise, there's little to nothing out for the show. There was yeah. a time there really crazy. Like, I had to fight tooth and nail. We did a coaster set uh, coming out for the anniversary. And each coaster, I forget how many, but we isolated images of the logo in for each doctor. It's a different logo, essentially. You know, or you could, you know, the Colin Baker and Davidson, you could keep the same or, you know, whatever. But for the most part, and they just, they, they did not like it. They didn't want it. They thought, you know, you can't. It's got to be one logo, the current logo. You can't mess with it. It's either the current logo or the Pertwee logo. That's all they wanted to see on packaging. That's why I don't think the Diamond logo ever ended up, you know, which I know was Pertwee in his last season, but it, that to me is the Baker logo. That never ended up on packaging of us, I don't think, except for the coaster set. I finally got them to do that. But they were really adverse to doing anything outside the, the lines, sort of. A lot of licensors don't think out of the box. It's it's kind of frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'll be part two. We'll go over all that in part two. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to do a little retrospective. I thank you for joining me on this. Thank you. I hope it. Uh, hope I didn't ramble too much. No, it's perfectly fine. Thanks, well, Jason. We'll... All right. Thanks, man. <laughs>